Okay, in terms of the stuff, as usual, mostly just bad news. Uh, upcoming deadlines, same event all along. Example uh, one, covering the stuff in part one, and quizzes part two, covering the stuff in part two. Deadline October 16th. Exam number two, quizzes part three. Deadline November 13th. And exam three, exam four, quizzes part four. Deadline five, December 4th. And these are all end of day, 11.59, p.m. And everything is up now, so if you if you did want to like uh, go ahead with the material, you can always do so at your convenience. The only thing I always recommend is before you know jumping ahead to you know test ahead of what we're covering, uh, try the sample test because each of the sections, if you go to the sample questions, is a practice test for each of the real tests, and it doesn't count against you or for you, so it's safe to do. And try that, and they're the same sort of questions in the real test. So if you try a sample one, it goes well. Then taking the real test, probably a good thing to do. If you take the sample test, then it's a disaster. Then you probably want to go back and analyze that disaster before taking the, the real test for real. Exam number five, covering all the stuff. Deadlines December 11th at noon. And exam five covers all the stuff. Again, best four to five exams count. For the paper, if you want to do a draft, which is highly recommended. Uh, the deadline for that is November 16th, mainly because the plus five bonus is November 18th. If the paper is turned in through Blackboard by end of day, November 18th, you get your base score plus five. So that's like the extra credit stuff. If you want to work, spend another week working on it, or for whatever reason, the full credit deadline is November 25th, also end of day, also on Blackboard. And the half credit deadline is December 4th, also in the day, also on Blackboard. So basically, best, good, not so good. October 16th is homecoming, and there's a convocation in the morning, and all kinds of homecoming stuff. And so in the ancient tradition of homecoming, October 16th is homecoming stuff, rather than normal class. If you want, you can spend the day working on the, the exams, etc. Or you can do things involving probably free food. So probably better choice there. OK, last time we're looking at consequentialism. And the idea is that's a general view that what you should do is make decisions based on consequences, try to maximize what is of value for the relevant beings. But of course, consequentialism is fairly generic. It need not be a moral theory. It would begin by looking at the first of the moral theories under consequentialism, namely ethical egoism. The idea that what, what I should do is act to maximize what is of value for me. And of course, what you should do is the same thing for yourself. And we looked at the basic idea, Adam Smith, Adam Smithing, went a lot around, and then I mentioned we'd go next to Thomas Holmes. And as we're told by prophecy, Thomas Holmes, well, at least this stuff has arrived. Before pressing on to some Hobbes stuff, anything about any previous stuff or stuff to be or stuff that's done that needs more stuff. Okay, so on to Tommy Hobbes. A little background for Tom. He was English, born in 1588, died in 1679, and is of course still dead today. He was educated in scholasticism, and as you might recall, when we talked about our good dead friend John Duns Scotus, his followers were scholastics, and that view was pretty much kind of on the out by the time Hobbes came around. He was rather critical of scholasticism and universities in general. He ended up getting a job as a tutor for the very wealthy Cavendish family. Apparently he knew Francis Bacon, who may or may not be related to Kevin Bacon, and Galileo, and probably knew Descartes, or at least had some writing you know, interaction with him, because he wrote a series of objections against Descartes' meditations, which were published by Descartes along with his replies. So he knew you know, smart folks back then. Now, probably his biggest influence, and we'll see more of this in part four, was the English Civil War, which began in 1642. And the main dispute, at least the history books record the main dispute, 
as a battle over the divine right of kings. The basic idea there is that it addresses the question of what is the basis of political authority? And one view put forth, as we'll see in part four, is the idea that one is the ruler because one is God. But of course, in Christian Europe, a king can't say, hey, I'm God. They can't even say, hey, I'm the son of God, because those jobs are taken. So what they did is sort of the third best thing, which is, hey, I rule by divine right. God wants me to be king. And the English were chopping each other up, apparently, because some accepted that, and some said, nope. And we also, underneath the sort of theological or physical dispute, there's also a contest between the monarchy, the absolute you know, ruler, ruler of the king, and of course the English parliament, upon which we based our homes. And we're just keeping up the long tradition of the executive branch fighting it out with the you know, legislative branch. His main claim to fame as a philosopher is a work known as the Leviathan. The name taken, of course, from the, the famous Leviathan of the Old Testament. And it was published in 1642. This book led him to be called the father of atheists. Not because his kids were atheists, but in the sense of he was regarded as presenting a viewpoint that led people to atheism. And even today, many people in the United States consider atheism to be about the worst thing. And when people are asked, you know, what do you accept an atheist president? The vast majority say, no way. So Hobbes could not be president. First, because he's dead. <laughs> and secondly, because he's not American. And third, possibly an atheist. So what was Tommy trying to do? Well. He based a lot of his stuff on physics, which was, you know, been around since the time of our good dead friend Thales, who, well, I don't want to say invented physics, but he, you know, developed physics, considered by some the first philosopher and the first scientist. But during this time period when Hobbes was Hobbesing, that was sort of the start of what we consider the modern age of science. You know, thinkers such as Galileo, Copernicus, etc., uh, Sir Isaac Newton. We're doing their stuff. And Hobbes really liked this new physics, and he wanted to follow that methodology. And during this time period, known as the modern era, the thinkers were trying to essentially break out of the dogmatism of the previous centuries. And you know, if you've had uh, world history, this is the age of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and so forth coming out of what people call the Dark Ages, so supposedly of ignorance, etc. And so we see this as the rise of reason and science. And so what he wanted to do, like many other thinkers at this time, was revise, revamp the study of the physical world, human nature, and society. And like many thinkers during this time, he took one scientific method as his approach, because he believed in the principle of Keep it simple. The idea you could find the one, you know, method, the one science to rule them all. What is still something we're pursuing today? If you, you know, talk to the scientific folks, and you ask them, like, what is the ultimate goal? One thing they might give as an answer is building the ultimate science that answers all the questions. And Hobbes is trying to do that. Did he succeed? No. Because if he did, we'd just be saying, Tommy Hobbes, he solved it all. <laughs> History is over. Now, so what did he do? Well, basically, he accepted a model that is still pretty standard today. One thing, if you ever had like physics, or biology, and chemistry, the method is to take very complex things and reduce them down to simple things. You know, take uh, like chemistry. You take, you know, complex chemical compounds and you explain them in terms of the elements that make them up. And of course we know the elements are made up of you know, smaller particles, and these of course are made up of other stuff. And the idea is to explain the complex by the simple. It's something done in chemistry, biology, physics, etc. You know, explaining the big phenomena with the little phenomena. And this is still going on today. Also, he was influenced by Galileo in the following way. 
Galileo, although was religiously devout, his physics involved taking the natural world, the world around us, and reducing it to matter, you know, physical stuff in motion. And of course, physics is just studying, you know, grossly oversimplifying it, studying the movement of matter. So it's movement of matter plus a whole lot of matter. But it's still true today. So objectives, take the complex, simplify it. He's going to look at it in terms of matter in motion with math. Now, putting it into some philosophical context, one camp he belongs to is a camp of empiricism. Historically, philosophers have split into two main camps over an important issue, which is this. How can you know about what's out there, what exists? One answer is given by people known as rationalists. And they believe you can know about what's out there, at least some of it, by pure reason. You can sit down, think about it really hard, or do some proofs, and you can prove something exists. A classic example of this is St. Anselm providing his ontological argument for God's existence, which is basically God is perfect, so he's going to exist. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't be perfect. But he is, so he does. Thus proving God's existence without even having to look. Now the empiricist said, that's BS. You can't prove stuff exists just by, you know, talking about it and doing some math. Their view is, the only way you know what exists really real for real is by empirical evidence. The knowledge of what we have that's out there comes from out there through the senses. So the way you know stuff exists is by empirical investigation. You know, empirical science. And that had a profound influence on you know, his philosophical views in general, and interestingly and boringly enough, on his ethics in particular. Another thing that had a big impact was his metaphysics. In philosophy, metaphysics is a study of the nature and structure of reality, what is really real for real. And it deals with questions like, does God exist? What is space? What is time? What are people? That type of stuff. Now, philosophers, when it comes to the question of, you know, what's really real for real, they tend to split conveniently enough into two camps. Well, three, actually. One view is commonly held by a lot of people. They may not know what it's called philosophically, but they believe this. Dualism is a view that you get two types of stuff. One is the body the shell, the machine. And driving this machine, driving this shell, is, of course, the ghost, the spirit, the mind. So if someone believes they have a body, but they are a soul, they're a dualist. Not in the sense of, like, you know, pistols at dawn, but in the sense of there's two types of stuff, physical stuff and mental stuff. Now, the main opposing camp is known as materialism, sometimes called physicalism. That's the view that it's all physical. It's all matter. We're material boys and girls in a material world. Not in the sense that, you know, we like money and cars and diamonds and big houses, which we of course do, but in the sense that all there is is physical matter. No ghosty stuff. So Hobbes is in this camp. If you ask Hobbes, is there any ghosty stuff? Spirits, minds, etc. It's a nope, just matter. Now, a third camp is the other obvious option, which is you can have body, soul, just body, and you can have just ghosty stuff. And that's known as idealism. It's held by our good dead friend, George Barclay. If you ever heard the famous you know, question, if a tree falls in the forest, there's no one there to hear it. Doesn't make a sound. That comes from George. And his answer is, yes, it does. Because God is always listening. So God hears a fall. So if anybody asks you that question, 
you can say, I got the answer. According to George Barclay, yes, it does, because God's there to hear it, because he's everywhere. So problem solved. If you want to see these and other exciting things, modern philosophy is offered every spring. Uh, also, if you need to knock off another humanities requirement, uh, a good choice. Okay, so he's an empiricist and a metaphysical materialist. So what impact does this have on God? Well, this is what he says. What he seems to be is pretty much an atheist. Because if he's a materialist, if there's a God, it has to be a material God. God has to be physical. And if there are angels, they have to be physical too. And of course, that's not the usual view of God. We don't think of God as being... You know, we, we, when people do paintings of God, they do like, you know, the guy with the gray beard up in the sky, you know, Sistine Chapel type of deal. But the usual view is that God is not a physical being. And so Hobbes says, well, if God exists, he's going to be like a fine vapor or mist or something. And as you might imagine, that did not go over particularly well. So probably no God. Now that has a profound impact on his moral view. Because if there's no God, that has a strong influence on you know, a person's view of morality. Now, last uh, sort of term, ontology. This comes from the Greek ontos, meaning thing. Or as I prefer to define it, stuff. Because stuff's my word. It's literally the study of things. What things there are. Not in terms of like, there being kiwis, the fruit, and the bird, and backpacks, and squirrels, and pumas, and mamas, etc. But in the sense of metaphysically, what is there? If you're making a list of the metaphysical entities, your ontology would be your list. So, for example, if you believe in God, God's on your ontological list. If you believe in matter, that's on the list. If you believe in souls, that's on the list. Now, for Hobbes, there's matter, that's really real for real. And, interestingly and boringly enough, he does sort of like an analogy. He accepts there are natural bodies, complex objects, you know, tables, chairs, screens, trees, etc. But, he also accepts there are artificial bodies, not in the sense of like, you know, tables and chairs, but the sense of political entities. So he essentially is looking at and analyzing these political entities, the body politic, so to speak. And so those are part of his ontology. Now, our main interest here is not political philosophy or political science, but ethics. But this stuff is important for the setup for his ethics. Before pressing on to that, though, Anything about this stuff that needs more stuff. You said meta metaphysical is what? Oh, uh, metaphysical, the a branch of philosophy dealing with the study of the nature and structure of reality. What is really real for real? So it's a big questions like, does God exist? What is space? What is time? What is a person? That type of stuff. What's for lunch? <laughs> so how does all this stuff impact his ethical view? Well, since he's a materialist, that means that his moral view can't have any like non-material stuff going on. And there are other moral views that do allow that. Plato, for example, took the view that there was a metaphysical good. We see in John Duns Scotus, God being the gravity of ethics. We see in Aquinas, the idea that God exists, and God creates the world with a particular moral order. So we have an eternal law, we have a metaphysical foundation to ethics. But Hobbes is a materialist, and most likely an atheist. So, all that stuff's out. So what he tries to do is this. He's not original in this. He tries to explain morality in terms of human psychology. 
Now, a predecessor to Hobbes, or predecessors, was a group of philosophers known as Epicureans. And you might be familiar with that, that word today because if someone enjoys the finer things in life, they're known as Epicureans, which comes from the philosophers who believe the, the greatest good is pleasure. So he's not the first you know, dead guy to come up with this idea of basing morality on human psychology. So he lays out a theory that's very similar to the Epicureans. What is good? Well, good means something you desire or want. That's to say pleasure. So on his view, we call things good, not because of like a metaphysical moral order, but essentially means if I like it, I call it good, because good is what I like. What is bad? What is evil? Well, those are things we are averse to, things that are painful. So since good and evil are a matter of pleasure and pain, and people vary what they think is enjoyable and what is painful, it follows that good and evil are quite subjective. Now, in terms of his psychology, he thinks people are what would be called egoistic hedonists. What does that mean? Well, this. The egoist part is that people are basically self-interested. You ask them who they're looking out for, themselves. The hedonist part comes from hedonism. A hedonist is someone who is basically a seeker of pleasure. They go through life trying to enjoy it as much as possible. So he thinks that we, psychologically, what motivates us is our own pleasure. So what are we looking for? Pleasure. Who's our own in our cases? Now again, that's a psychological hypothesis, that people are motivated just by their pursuit of pleasure. So good to us is what yields pleasure, and evil is what yields pain to each of us individually. So on his view, there's really no sense in asking the question, should people be that way or not? Because his view is people just are that way. This is where the ethical egoism comes in, because his view is basically, that's how people operate. So the only plausible, the only possible moral theory would be ethical egoism, because that's the way we are. We can't be any different. So what we should be doing is acting to maximize what we think of as pleasure and avoiding pain. And our concern is just with ourselves. My concern is me, your concern is me. Before getting into a thin slice from the Leviathan, just a little chunk off the Leviathan, anything about the stuff so far? It needs more stuff. Okay. So further ado, the Leviathan. Now Hobbes, again, is approaching this, what he thinks of as be as scientifically. So he's going to try to you know, lay out things based on his empirical observations and work through to explain how this works. Now the first thing he notes is this. Looking at the natural world, he notes that we are naturally basically equal. I mean, true, there are differences. But he thinks that the differences between us, in general, are not extreme enough that they make a huge difference, that essentially we're you know, basically equal. And we'll see more of this in part four. Now, because we're basically, basically equal, we have an equal hope in trying to attain our ends, to get what we like and avoid what we don't like. Well, this immediately causes trouble. How so? Well, if we both want the same thing, and either cannot or will not share, we become enemies. And therefore, we end up being each other's way, and that leads to trouble, attempts to destroy or subdue each other. So right at the start, his view is essentially we're basically equal, 
So the competition is pretty balanced. And we all want to attain our goals. And then we run into competition because we often want the same stuff. Now, one of Hobbes' key themes is that problem. So as he sees it, what if we're in a scenario where there's no power over us to keep us in check, keep us in line? He thinks, well, they're just going to make us pretty sad. Why? Well, one reason is this. <clears throat> in general, how highly does a person rate him or herself? Yeah, very high. And true. I mean, true. There are some people who who lack in self-esteem, but most people think, in general, pretty high of themselves. But that is a good thing. There are people who do have issues with with self-esteem. So, what happens if other people do not recognize how truly awesome you are? Is that a good feeling? No. No. And so, to not recognize your greatness is, of course, a grave insult. And that, of course, leads to trouble. So basically, according to Hobbes, three grounds for dispute. Ground one, competition. We compete to get other people's stuff. Now, back in, you know, Hobbes is talking about, you know, way back and you know, the way back. But, of course, we can apply this still today. We compete over jobs, power, prestige, wealth, you know, pretty much everything. And that leads to competition, and that leads to trouble. Secondly, of course, once we get stuff, we want to keep it. So that leads to violence to protect our stuff. Thirdly, because we value ourselves very highly, and we expect others to recognize our awesomeness, if others fail to do so, we will engage in violence in response to their unbearable insults. So, since we're concerned about getting stuff, we're violent. As you want to keep what we get, we're violent. And since we have pride, we're violent. So what does this lead to? Well, the obvious path leads to war. If there's no one to keep us in line, according to Hobbes, we engage in war. Now, why then do we ever get out of this? Because the question he's trying to address is, if we are you know, ethical egoists, if all we care about is ourselves, and we regard what is good is what is good for, well, in my case, me, in your case, you, how do we ever get out of this mess? So, one way out is this. In the state of war, in his classic quote, there is continual fear of danger, of violent death, in the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And essentially, we don't have any of the good stuff. We have no industry, no knowledge, arts, leisure, iPhones, you know, Netflix. And so, when we're in the state of war, we're missing out on all this good stuff. Now, other thinkers, and we'll see some of them, we've seen some, we'll see more later on, believe that there is an independent morality, like Thomas Aquinas. Even before you have, like, you know, political authority, you get God and eternal law. With John Stuart Mill, morality is not based on you know, having social order, it's based on utility. We look at our good dead friend John Locke, we've got God, and we have morality before we have civil society. But as Hobbes sees it, before we have any you know, law, there is no such thing as just or unjust. Because right and wrong, justice or injustice, he believes, rests on the concept of law. So before there's law, civil society, there is nothing just Nothing right, nothing wrong. So then, how do we get from being so awful, being an eternal war, to peace? 
Well, here's how he thinks it happens. We have basically three motivations that he thinks enable us, despite our selfishness, to create justice. First one is this, death. Do we really like death? We don't know. We wish to avoid that. And we know if we're in a state of perpetual war of all against all, essentially like, you know, death match, we know that probably ends with death. And so it gives us a motivation to put an end to that. Secondly, do we like stuff? Yes. And if we're in a state of a perpetual war, we can't have nice stuff. Thirdly, we hope to attain stuff. And so we have three motivations. Avoid death, we want stuff, and we hope that through our efforts, we can get stuff. So what we do, at least according to Hobbes, is this. Out of pure self-interest, we try to create peace. Now, interestingly, boringly enough, one that makes Hobbes sort of distinct is we looked at just our good dead friends, Aristotle and Aquinas, and their view was is that more morality, more laws and rules don't depend on human society. They're not based on agreements between us. They're, in the case of Aquinas, they're put by God into the eternal order of the world. There's an objective morality. For Aristotle, there's also an objective morality based on our, our nature. Hobbes, though, morality comes after us and after we, in a way, create these agreements. And so it's you know, an interesting or perhaps boring you know, question. Is morality something that exists apart from us that we can appeal to? You know, when talking about justice or injustice, good or bad, or do we create that stuff? And it makes a big difference, whether we just kind of make it up or whether it's really real for real. Now Hobbes thinks that what we do is we create agreements. And these articles, we call them the laws of nature, discovered by reason. And here's how they work, according to Hobbes. The first, um, there are first and second laws of nature. He also talks about contracts. First off, though, we have what he calls the right of nature, or in the cool Latin, just natural. Here's the idea. We have, as our basic right, the right to use our power as we will to preserve ourselves. So right number one, you have the liberty the freedom to do whatever it takes to not die. Secondly, we have the liberty of doing anything we regard as the best way to bring this about. Now, liberty for him is an absence of external impediments. So his view basically is this. The right of nature is that we are we have the freedom, the liberty, to do whatever it takes to survive. Now, this is rather different. We'll, we'll look in part uh, four at our good dead friend John Locke, talking about nicer rights. But Hobbes, you know, the basic right is you do what it takes to not die. Well, because, of course, it's in your self-interest. Now, what about a law of nature? Well, in the, in the cool Latin, lex naturalis. Well, this is a rule which we find by reason, that forbids us to do what is destructive of our life, or to harm us, or takes away means by which we can preserve ourselves. So the difference between right and law is this. A right is a liberty. You are free to do or not do. Law determines and binds. It's what you have to do obligated to do. So what does he regard as the fundamental law of nature? Well, given the basic right, whatever it takes to survive, that's what we have the freedom to do. He thinks what follows from this is what he calls the right to all things. How so? Well, 
if right number one is you have the freedom to do whatever it takes to survive, that also gives you the liberty to the right to all things, whatever you might need. And this could be you know, objects like you know, clubs or rocks, but he you know, takes it you know, to the extreme. So if you really need someone's arm to beat them to death with it, you have the right to it. But if they need your arm to beat you to death with it, they totally have the right to that as well. It literally is a right to all things. Everyone has a right to everything. Or so it comes. So what then is the law? Well, the fundamental law is this. And according to him, reason tells us this is what we ought to do. Now, it doesn't come from God, as far as we can tell from Hobbes' view, but somehow reason finds this for us. And it is the idea. Each of us ought to endeavor peace as far as we have hope of obtaining it. And when we cannot, we should seek and use all advantages of war. So, first part is seek peace. Why? Well, self-interest. It's better than being, like, dead. The second part, defend yourself by all means necessary. And so, as he sees it, that is law, law one. Seek peace, but do whatever it takes to survive. Now, the second law for him is this. He thinks that from the command to derive peace, we should do the following. We should set aside our right to everything as far as you think it's necessary for peace and self-defense and limit your liberty so as to have that peace. So basically his view is the second law tells us since the first law is seek peace, but if you can't get it, you know, get ready for war. The second law is you should be willing in order to bring about peace to limit your right to all things. So, I mean, one obvious thing would be you would give up your right to, like, you know, kill other people. And in turn, they give them the right to kill you, and that enables you to achieve, hopefully, a degree of peace. Or so it comes. Now again, this is all of self-interest. Now before pressing on to the other laws of nature, and to wrap up our good dead friend Hobbes, anything about that stuff that needs more stuff. Don't have to change the slide. <laughs> um, other laws. Now, the third law for Hobbes is this. He says that we're obligated to perform our covenants. Without uh, this, covenants are empty words. Now, how do we make that happen? Well, Hobbes does face a rather serious and obvious problem, namely this. If we're totally you know, selfish, looking out for our own self-interest, we would realize that you know, it's in our interest to fall, you know, seek peace, avoid war, give up our right to things. But any time we have a chance to you know, break that limitation, to grab an advantage, it would be apparently reasonable to do so, which would seem to wreck things. And so the problem is, how could we ever know we could trust people? And to use you know, a crappy example, let's do like a zombie apocalypse scenario. Oh, zombie apocalypse, everything collapses. No more law, police, courts, etc. We're running around the zombie apocalypse, you know, alone, scavenging with guns, etc. we can. And suppose you run across you run across other people. They all have guns. And there's food and stuff. And you notice other people have got like some food that you could eat. And if you really think about it, people are food. Just just say, zombie apocalypse. And so you realize, well, if I like fight with these people, I could get hurt and killed, and that'd be bad for me, we'd be better off working together. But on the other hand, if you just shoot them, 
when you're asleep, you take their ammunition, you get more ammo, take their guns, you get more guns, you take their food and water and supplies, and your chance of surviving goes up. And they're thinking the same thing. So how could you ever trust, with no laws in place, how could you ever trust anyone else? And the answer, of course, is you, you can't. You need some system, according to Hobbes, by which people follow their covenants, their agreements. And of course, if someone just says, yeah, you know, you can totally trust me, go to sleep. I'm not going to shoot you in the head. I'm going to kill you with a brick, because I don't want to waste ammo. So what Hobbes does to solve that is, as we'll see when we get to part four, he believes we need a system that enables enforcement of those agreements. We need someone to keep everyone in line. But again, this is all out of, out of self-interest. So then, for Hobbes, what is this moral philosophy going to be? Well, contrary to the, the dead guys we've been looking at so far, he thinks the science of the laws he presented, you know, the law of basically, you know, seek peace, avoid war, well, you know, prepare for war if you can't get peace, um, lay down the right to all things, if other people agree to do so, and form your covenants, keep to your agreements. And he thinks that is the basis of morality. That's how it works. The only true moral philosophy. And so moral philosophy for him is the science of what is good and evil in the preservation of, well, us. So then what is the good and what is the evil? Well, as Hobbes notes, he claims his view of what good and evil is, is that good and evil are just names, words, that signify what we like, what, what we desire in the case of good, and what we wish to avoid in the case of evil. Now, of course, one of the problems is, is that people have different views about what they like and what they dislike. And so this leads to conflict. Also, interestingly, as he points out, People have disagreements with themselves about what they like and dislike. I mean, to use like a fairly simple you know, example, take, um, well, someone has like a cake, and they're like, wow, cake, and they eat the whole cake, because the point they wanted the cake. They eat the cake, and like, then they regret eating the entire cake. So now they're, you know, they're disagreeing with themselves. That was a bad bad decision. And so because of this, we have disputes, conflicts, and war. Now, when we're in a situation where we don't have society and authority ruling over us, the fact that we have different likes and dislikes and disagreements means there'll be conflict and war. And so he thinks that we agree that peace is good, and the means of peace. And he thinks that we accept what we consider the classic virtues, like justice, etc., as being good. But as, as Hobbes claims, this is sort of you know, reversed. Thinkers like Aquinas and Aristotle believe that you know, the virtues, you know, virtue is its own reward, that type of deal. Hobbes' view, though, it's, that's not the case. It's not that the virtues are their own reward and are good in themselves. These virtues are a means to an end. They are essentially not laws themselves, but are what, can do, are what are conducive to our existing in society. So, recap of Hobbes is basically, he thinks it's a matter of psychological fact. We are hedonist, egoist, we're selfish, concerned about our own pleasure. But, somewhat ironically, that leads to conflict and trouble which means we won't be able to achieve our goals. So what we have to do is control that particular problem. And for Hobbes, this gives rise to what we call morality. We build society, set up laws and rules, because we regard that as being in our self-interest. So for Hobbes, what we call morality is entirely a matter of self-interest. It's not laid, up, laid down by God or by the natural order in the sense of you know, Aristotle, it's pure self-interest, at least according to him. And then he died, and he's still dead today. 
Now, before pressing on to our last stuff for today, namely some problems with ethical egoism, anything about Tommy Hobbes that needs more <coughs> Tommy stuff? Now, various thinkers have cranked out problems with ethical egoism. And all the moral views will look at one of the problems, because if there was a problem free one, and the ethics class would just be, here's the one correct view, learn it well, this is all you need to know. First argument is this. It's the inconsistent argument. And here's how it works. If I'm an ethical egoist, what I have to advocate is, is that each person operates in their own self-interest. So for example, suppose there's a job I want. But I, of course, other people want. So what I'd have to say is, is that I should seek the job because it's in my own self-interest, but everyone else who wants the job, who sees it in their self-interest, should do that too. But of course, as an individual, I don't want anybody else to seek that job. I want to get the job. I want to be the winner. I want everyone else to be losers. So how do I reconcile being ethical egoist, saying everyone should act in their own self-interest, with my own view that I should be the winner, that everyone else should be losers. Because in the sort of the trap is basically, if I'm selfish and I think I should just get it, there's no problem. Because selfish is all about you know me, not about you. But weirdly, in a way, if I'm an ethical egoist, I'm accepting a moral theory. I'm accepting that I should act in my interest, and so should you. But of course, I don't want you to do that because I want to get all the all this stuff. So how does the ethical egoist handle that little problem? Well, here's the reply. The standard reply is that a person can distinguish between her theoretical view, this is what ethics is, and her personal desires. This is what I want. And they often use an analogy to sports. When someone's you know, competing in sports, they can accept abstractly the idea that everyone should compete to try to win. But at the same time, they can want to win themselves. Now, kind of a counter to this counter is to say, well, this still seems to be a problem because the ethical egoist should really want to win. They should tell them they should be the, the one getting the stuff. And this seems inconsistent with their theory that everyone should compete. And of course, the ethical egoist will say, no, it's not. It's like sports. And the person objecting will say, no, it's not like that at all. Because fairness in sports assumes a different morality, like a concept of fairness. And so it can go round and round on this. Second problem. Now, this problem is not really like a you know, severe objection, which is why it's called the ironic argument. And here's the idea. Ethical egoism, putting it a little crudely, is very much like selfishness. Now, suppose someone is very selfish. Would it be smarter of them to tell people that? You suppose a person's out on a date. They say, a little bit of myself, I'm selfish. I don't care about other people, all about me. You know, if um, you were drowning and I didn't want to get my shoes wet, I'd let you die. I value my shoes more than you. Uh, pretty much that's how I am. Now, if someone went around talking like that, no one would want to have any dealings with them because they would be like, that person is horrible. Yeah, so if you're selfish, you never want to tell people you're selfish. Just like if someone's a liar, if they're smart, they should never tell people they're a liar. Likewise, if someone's an ethical egoist, if they believe that if they're basically saying everyone should act in their own self interest, that actually would not be a smart strategy because people would say, hmm. This person believes they should always do what's in their best interest. That means they're effectively acting like a selfish person. So a smart ethical egoist would never tell people that they are ethical egoists. They would say there's something else. But here's where the ironic part comes in. Alan Ron, Thomas Hobbes, and other ethical egoists who write books and articles about it, they let the cat out of the bag they tell people that ethical egoism is the way to go. Which would seem stupid because if you found like the secret to success, you and the secret was being ethical egoist, 
you wouldn't tell other people. It's like the secret is being selfish, you don't tell people that, because it interferes with your success. So how could they reply to that? Well, one reply, which actually works out pretty well, is that you could say, well, the ethical egoist kind of weighed you know, the, the advantages, that if they could get more out of revealing it, and selling books and so forth, and creating a movement, then it could be totally worth it, because they could get, get a lot of stuff. For example, Anne Ron got super famous. She has a whole you know, following even today. People who are called objectivists, and her view is called objectivism. There, there's an Anne Ron group. She made movies, and their, her book, uh, Alice Drug, was wish they made into a very bad movie. But she was very successful. She took ethical egoism to the bank. And so one possible reply is, if you can make a stack of cash off from it, that's, that's great. Next time, we'll finish up looking at the paradox argument. So on Friday, to paradoxes, and then to utilitarianism, then more stuff, and then it shall be at the end. Not a whole thing, just this stuff.